Uh, today I want to talk to you about uh, quantum statistics, something that uh, was initiated by Professor S. N. Bose in 1924 when he was teaching in Dhaka University. <clears throat> He, uh, he was teaching quantum theory to the MSc classes and he f felt very uneasy about what's called uh, a deduction of Planck's law. Planck's law is empirically correct. Planck's law describes how a hot body radiates various um, wavelengths of electromagnetic radiation starting from very very high frequencies and there was a problem the problem was according to classical theory <coughs> when you go to very high frequencies, that is beyond ultraviolet and so on, X-rays, gamma rays, then a body should emit infinite amount of radiation in one second or in unit time. But obviously, uh, that is, uh, although the theory predicts it, it's, it's not nice. And uh, in fact, experiments show that, show that that is not the case. Uh, as you keep increasing the frequency, the amount of radiation goes up, but then it suddenly drops at very high frequencies, and that's called the Planck curve, which has no classical explanation. The classical thing is called the it's called the ultraviolet catastrophe. That is, as you go towards the ultraviolet, it should just radiate infinite energy. Of course, physically that does not happen. And so that was the first indication that there was something wrong with classical theory. And that was when Max Planck, by sheer inspiration, wrote down a formula which fits that curve exactly. And he did it on if I am not wrong, 14th December of the year 1900. He was having tea with one of the great people who were doing these experiments and he said, this is the curve we have found. And after he left, he just wrote down a formula which fitted it. And But he had to introduce a new physical constant, which is nowadays called Planck's constant, which is a very, very, very small number but without it, you cannot fit the curve. So he had this formula which fits the curve and which shows that you need a new physical constant. But he had no idea how to derive that from theoretical ideas. Of course, you couldn't derive it from classical theory because one already had the classical theory which which would agree with this curve for lower frequencies, but would disagree with the curve for higher frequencies. However, he gave some derivation. Then later on, other people, other great scientists like Ehrenfest, and, and others, you would know the names, but including Einstein, give, tried to give derivations of this formula from theoretical uh, assumptions. But all of them, Bose found, was logically unsatisfactory because all these derivations were using some classical ideas and some new quantum ideas. And Bose said this is not 
logically satisfactory, I want to give a derivation which is entirely quantum mechanical. I will not use any classical theory. And he gave one. So he sent this paper to a British journal called Philosophical Magazine. The story is that it was not published. Then in June, 4th June 1924, he sent off this paper to Einstein with a covering letter in which he said that this is what I have tried to do. And uh, Einstein received it. Einstein, of course, by 1924 was a huge figure, as you have seen. He had got his Nobel Prize. The bending of light was confirmed. So he was a big man, and uh, Bose and Saha and others really looked upon him as the modern guru. So he sent it to, to his guru. Um, he, he addressed the letter as, I think he said, revered, respected, Master, something like that. So he wrote this paper, <clears throat> sent it. Einstein looked at it and he jumped. He said, my God, now I've got it. Because his theory of photons had a problem, which other people had pointed out, that if photons behave like particles, I mean, if light behaves like particles, and those particles are like billiard balls, then you will never get Planck's law from there. But Planck's law is known to be correct. And Planck's law is the basis of quantum theory. So here is a young man, a brat, saying light should be quantized. And yet he's doing it in a manner which is contradicting Planck's law. So he doesn't know what he's talking about. But he knew that he was right. People felt he was right, but there was this logical contradiction, which had been pointed out by various people already in the year 1911. Now, Bose's derivation, which is purely quantum mechanical, showed how, why, a gas of photons, which is light, is will give you Planck's law, provided this quanta of light, which we call photons, did not behave like billiard balls. Their statistics had to be different. They had to be entirely new kinds of particles, new kinds of entities, let us call them. And he showed what sort of properties they must have in order that Planck's law can be derived. And from that, uh, people learned from his derivation that these, these part, so-called particles, the quantum particles, have some property which is nowadays called indistinguishability. They are not only all identical. You can have identical twins, but these twins or multiples are indistinguishable. Now, what does that mean? In terms of statistics, accounting, it boils down to the following statement. Supposing you three are there, and you are three identical human beings. You are all human beings, but you, are, you can be labeled. She can be labeled by a name, A, U by B, and she by C, and by D, and so on. So although you are all human beings, you carry a label, and I can follow you through time to see where you are going. But if you are indistinguishable, 
then I cannot put a label on you. Therefore, I cannot follow you. Example, you are sitting in the row with four of you, say, and we ask the question, in how many ways can I arrange the four of you? That is, there are four chairs or boxes, and I want to put each one of you in one box. Or I can put all of you in one box. I can put, uh, you know, I can leave boxes empty. All kinds of possibilities are there. So, if there are four boxes and you ask me, how many ways can I put four objects into four boxes so that um, each box has only one particle. That's one way of counting. Otherwise, you can say, let's, let's talk about only three. So you have three boxes and three particles. I can put all the three particles into this box or that box or that box. So there are three ways of doing it. Or I can put one particle each in in a box. Or I can put two particles in one box and one particle in another box and so on. So this was the way statistics was done and this is called the Boltzmann statistics which is the classical statistics. That's how billiard balls, atoms, molecules were thought to behave as far as their statistical properties are concerned. But Supposing you are three here, and you are in three boxes, and you are all not only identical, but indistinguishable. Then once I have put one in each box, even if I shuffle you, I don't get a new arrangement. But in classical statistics, Boltzmann statistics, each new arrangement is a distinguishable arrangement, because I can follow whom I am putting in which box. Both said photons are not like that. You can you shuffle. You cannot say that I have got a dist. I I know. I cannot distinguish between these arrangements. In which case the number of possibilities decreases. And in short, that's enough to get Planck's law. So this new he proposed a new statistics which later on Einstein extended to material atoms. Bose did it only for photons. But Einstein said, uh, well, this should be applicable to material particles as well. Let's see what happens if I apply Bose's way of counting to material particles. And he did that. And he predicted a completely new state of matter at very, very, very low temperatures something that we today call the Bose-Einstein condensates. They were discovered about 10, 15 years ago. To discover that, you have to go to very, very, very low temperatures. Now, there is a certain temperature which is called the absolute zero. This was uh, first conceived by Lord Kelvin, who was then working in Edinburgh University. What is absolute zero? Now, the temperature of an object actually is determined by the motion of the molecules in it, or atoms and molecules. They, they are flying around. And the faster they fly around and jiggle, the higher the temperature. This is called the kinetic theory of matter. Now, if you lower the temperature, then this motion decreases. Right? As you keep lowering and lowering and lowering and lowering, then Kelvin said, there must be a state when nothing moves and you can't go below it. So that he defined as absolute zero. And it turns out that it is at minus 273 degrees Kelvin. So you have to go that far down. Zero is pretty cold, right? Minus 40s and so on you get in, 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 in Russia and in other places. That's about the maximum. 
this is minus 273 so you have to somehow cool things down to that temperature to see this and people have done it so I'll show you videos about all this but this is just the background so of course what Einstein did was I both had said that uh, if you think it's uh, if you like the idea would you please arrange for it to be published in some important journal so what Einstein did is he translated it himself into German and published it in one of the most famous German journals of the time called Zeitschrift für Physik and he put a footnote translators footnote in which he said I consider this an important step forward and I will show in future publications that this this statistics is applicable to material atoms and that of course is a huge stir all over the world here is Albert Einstein proposing something new and it has come from a completely unknown Indian working in Dhaka and then Einstein published three papers within six months or so in which showed how important this new way of counting it is and this is really it the old counting has to be given up and he predicted this new state of matter which is called Bose-Einstein condensates now in this uh, there are two other things that happened later on is that as people there's a whole branch of physics called cryogenics where people study properties of matter at very very low temperatures so they cool down gases like they produce liquid nitrogen liquid helium liquid helium is at four degrees absolute it's almost almost there at absolute zero but not quite now they found that when you cool down substances to such low temperatures they subtly acquire new properties and two of these properties are very interesting one is called superfluidity and the other is superconductivity now what is a superfluid now ordinary fluids like water honey anything that you know of if you make it pass through a pipe then uh, there is a certain resistance that is felt by the fluid in coming out which is called viscosity like honey is very viscous it won't flow easily through a small uh, very narrow pipe whereas water will flow better alcohol will flow better and so on also if you heat a uh, liquid it will flow better but if you start cooling it then it will condense it won't flow at all but if there are if you if you can keep it in the liquid form at very low temperatures then also you will find that it this viscosity will go down and down and down but then suddenly like that viscosity will simply vanish and this liquid will flow through the tiniest possible uh, pipes without feeling any resistance this is called superfluidity and superconductivity is like this you know you use copper wires and other wires to pass electricity how does electric current flow I think we talked about it last time the electrons flow through the tiny particles electrons they flow through that wire and that constitutes the current but while flowing through it it encounters many obstacles you see and gets scattered and the higher the temperature the more is that so uh, scattering so the resistance is basically due to this kind of scattering inside that wire scattering of electrons now if you cool it down cool it down and cool it down 
then this resistance will start going down. And again the same thing is seen, suddenly at what is called a critical temperature, all the resistance simply just disappear and the current flows without any resistance whatsoever. Then that substance is supposed to, uh, then behaves like a superconductor. And superconductors are extremely useful in practice. Uh, as we will see, you can tran uh, tr transmit trains at very high speeds and you can save a lot of energy wastage because your resistance is going down and going down. So you are, you are wasting less and less energy. So that is why it has tremendous practical importance. People found, and people got Nobel Prizes for doing this work, that all this is because of Bose's statistics. Somehow, at that temperature, suddenly, things become bosons. And bosons flow without any resistance. Marvelous. But Bose never got a Nobel Prize. I think three or four Nobel Prizes were won, all based on his work, but he was not given a Nobel Prize. It's one of the sad things. But who cares? Because people uh, realize now that every year somebody or the other gets a Nobel Prize. And even if you ask a physicist to name the Nobel laureates in the last 10 years, they won't be able to. But is there a single physicist or nowadays, even I would call a single educated man who has not heard of Bose. So, what has it meant? Bosons have become a household word. And this word was coined by a British physicist, Paul Dirac, who's a great, great guy. He wrote a book in 1928 called Principles of Quantum Mechanics. And in that book, he first proposed the word Bose, boson for particles which obey Bose's statistics. There is an alternative quantum statistics which was discovered in, within a year or two of Bose's work, which is called the Fermi-Dirac statistics. Dirac himself. And Dirac himself named those particles not Diracons, but fermions. He was such a humble person. He could have easily said these particles should be called Diracons, but no, fermions, after Enrico Fermi. So you have bosons and you have fermions. And everything in the world is composed of some boson and fermion. Now examples of fermions, electrons, protons, neutrons, all these are fermions. And fermions have the property that you can't put more than one fermion in one box or in one state. Once that is done, you can't put any, once an electron is there in one state, no, no other electron can go into that state. This is called Pauli's exclusion principle. Like here, you, you are all obeying the exclusion principle because these chairs will not allow more than one person to sit. So you are all like fermions now. So once all the chairs are filled, finished, nobody else can come in. This is called the exclusion principle. But Bose is different. Bose can allow any number of bosons to get into a particular state. And that is what causes superconductivity and so superfluidity, Bose-Einstein condensation. All these are because of that property. So you have fermions and you have bosons and everything else is made up of fermions or bosons. Examples of bosons or photons or bosons. There are other bosons. You now know of the Higgs boson. There are other bosons like W boson, Z boson and so on. Pions are bosons, kaons are bosons. Anything that obeys Bose's statistics are called bosons. So just as when a child is born, you want to know whether it's a boy or a girl. So, 
whenever a particle is discovered, people want to know whether it's a boson or a fermion. Or if you are proposing a new particle, you have to tell us whether you are proposing a boson or you are proposing a fermion. Okay? So this is the state of affairs. Is there any question on it? I think I've, I've started feeling hot. I don't know. I asked him to switch off the AC, but now I'm feeling a little warm. I'll show you seven short videos, but before that, I think we can ask one or two questions. Or shall we wait for the videos and then go on to questions? Is there anything that you want to ask right now? Anything that I have said that you haven't understood? Hmm? Nothing. Then I'll go on and show you the videos. Now, superconductors have one peculiar property, which is that uh, they do not allow any magnetic fields to go through them. This is called the Meissner effect, which is why they can levitate. This is called magnetic levitation. And people have built super fast trains based on this principle. It's called maglev. M-A-G-L-E-V. Maglev. Okay, so here is a video which shows you what it actually means in practice. So that is something. Uh, just let's watch. This is normal normal thing. This black thing can be made into a superconductor by putting liquid nitro nitrogen in it. So it cools down and at some stage it becomes a superconductor. How do we know? This one is a magnet. So you put the magnet there and it floats because a superconductor will not allow the magnetic lines of force from that magnet to pass through it. So that, that creates this repulsion. So there's nothing inside between them. But as, as it uh, warms up, as it warms up, it will finally drop because then it is no longer a superconductor. So it can allow electromagnetic uh, magnetic fields to go through it. And all this is because of Professor Bose's statistics. The particles inside have become bosons. Now how they become bosons is another story for which Nobel Prize has been given. Now you see it will gradually drop, which means it is no longer a superconductor. So one test of superconductivity is to see whether you have this levitation. You just bring a magnet and put it there. Plummeting over 200 degrees. You want to say something, sir? Uh, can you hear this? Yeah, Older than any place on Earth, where physicists say a whole new world begins. Minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit at the temperature of this liquid nitrogen. So much fun. Oh, by the way, if you put substances into liquid nitrogen, they become brittle. Flowers become brittle. <laughs> so don't, don't put your hand into a liquid nitrogen. It can be broken off just like that. This is Eric Cornell, who got the Nobel Prize for discovering Bose-Einstein condensates. Temperature is a measure of atomic motion. With less and less the farther down you go, 
why not make zero the place where all motion would stop? He calculated that would happen at minus 459.67 degrees Fahrenheit. This is Fahrenheit, huh? In centigrade, it will be 273. Okay, so that Q word is the Q quantum statistics, Bose. So you see how 
trying to solve a fundamental theoretical problem of understanding the nature of objects, the nature of reality, eventually trans gets translated into technology of such tremendous uh, benefit to mankind. This would not be possible with classical Boltzmann statistics. You need quantum statistics. Now here is uh, something on liquid, liquid helium, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, superfluidity, where liquid helium becomes a superfluid. All the boiling stops, Suddenly, it becomes. You see that the bubbling stops, and at the surface of the liquid helium is completely still. The temperature is actually being lowered even further now, but nothing particular is happening. Well, this this is really one of the great phenomena in, in 20th century physics. The liquid helium had turned into a superfluid, which displays some really odd properties. Here I have a beaker with an unglazed ceramic bottom. Ultra-fine porosity. Porosity, ultra-fine porosity. Tiny pores can hold liquid helium. But the moment the helium turns superfluid, it leaks through. We call this kind of flow a superflow. Superfluid helium can do things we might have believed impossible. It appears to defy gravity. A thin film climb walls and escape its container. This is because a superfluid has zero viscosity. It can even produce a frictionless fountain, one that never stops flowing. Superfluidity and superconductivity were baffling concepts for scientists. New radical theories were needed to explain them. You know, when I said that uh, bosons are indistinguishable. It means that, like right now, you all are individuals, right? And that is why you can be distinguished. But if you lose your individuality, your identity, then you become a boson. It's almost like Buddhist philosophy, right? <laughs> if you lose yourself, your identity, then you are a boson. So let us see this. And bosons also are at the same time both particles and waves. That's the other beautiful thing about them. In the 1920s, quantum theory was emerging as the best hope of understanding these strange phenomena. Its central idea was that atoms do not always behave like individual particles. Sometimes they merge together and behave like waves. <laughs> they can also be particles and waves at the same time. Even for great minds like Albert Einstein, this strange paradox was hard to accept. In 1925, young Indian physicist it's actually in 1924 Bose, sent Einstein a paper he'd been unable to publish. Bose had attempted to apply the mathematics of how light particles behave to whole atoms. Einstein realized the importance of this concept and did some further calculations. He predicted that on reaching extremely low temperatures, just a hair above absolute zero, it might be possible to produce a new state of matter that followed quantum rules. It would not be a solid or liquid or gas. It was given a name almost as strange as its properties. A Bose-Einstein condensate. For the next 70 years, people could only dream about making such a condensate, which has never been seen in nature. Matter can exist in various states. 
Atoms at high temperature always form gases. If you cool the gas, it becomes a liquid. If you cool the liquid, it becomes a solid. But under certain circumstances, if you cool atoms far enough to extremely low temperatures, they undergo a very strange transformation. They undergo an identity crisis. So let me show you what I mean by an identity crisis. When you go to low temperatures, the quantum mechanical properties of the atoms become important. These are very strange, very unfamiliar to us, but in fact, each one of these atoms starts to display wave-like properties. So instead of points like that, you have little wave packets like that moving around. It's really difficult for me to explain just why that is, but that's the way it is. Now, if you go to very low temperatures, the size of these packets gets longer and longer and longer, and then suddenly, if you get them cold enough, they start overlapping. And when they overlap, the system behaves not like individual particles, but particles which have lost their identity. They all think they're everywhere. This little wave packet over here can't tell it whether it's this one or that one or that one or that one or that one or, that one or that there and it's there and it's there. They're all in one great big quantum state. They're all overlapping. They're all doing the same thing. And what they're doing to a good approximation is they're simply sitting at rest. This Bose-Einstein condensate is very difficult to imagine or to visualize. I can imagine what it's like to be an atom running around gaily, freely bouncing into things, sometimes going fast, sometimes going slow. But on the Bose condensate, I'm everywhere at once. I've lost my identity. I don't know who I am anymore. I'm at rest and all the other atoms around at rest, but they're not other atoms around. We're all just one great big quantum system. There's nothing else like that in physics, and certainly not in human experience. So just to think about this causes me wonder and confusion. And we have seen how it accounts for superfluidity, superconductivity, and so on. And now, of course, the last thing that was discovered was the Higgs boson. So you must know a little bit about Higgs bosons. So let us start with uh, what is a Higgs boson? Can you hear? Peter Higgs took some ideas that were floating around at the time, added an insight or two of his own, and proposed that there was an energy field that permeated the entire universe. This energy field is now called the Higgs field. The reason he proposed this field was that nobody understood why some subatomic particles had a great deal of mass, while others had little, and some had none at all. The energy field that Higgs proposed would interact with the subatomic particles and give them their mass. Very massive particles would interact a lot with the field, while massless particles wouldn't interact at all. To better understand the idea, we can use the analogy of water and swimmers. In our analogy, the water serves the role of the Higgs field. A barracuda, being supremely streamlined, interacts only slightly with the field and it can move through it very easily. The barracuda would then be similar to a low-mass particle. In contrast, my buddy Eddie, no stranger to donuts, can only move very slowly through the water. In our analogy, Eddie is a massive particle made massive by interacting a lot with the water. The lightest of the familiar subatomic particles is the electron, while in the subatomic world, the king of mass is the top quark. It weighs about as much as an entire atom of gold, about 350,000 times more than the electron. I'd like to stress that we believe the top quark is not more massive because it's bigger. It's not. In fact, we believe that both the top quark and the electron are exactly the same size. Indeed, they both have zero size. The top quark is more massive than the electron simply because it interacts more with the Higgs field. Actually, if the Higgs field didn't exist, neither of these particles would have any mass at all. Now, in the press, you don't hear about the Higgs field, but rather the Higgs boson. How are these two things related? The Higgs boson is the smallest bit of the Higgs field. To understand how that works, we should again return to water. 
Everyone knows what water is. If you're immersed in it, you know that water is everywhere. It's a continuous medium, and there are no holes in it. We also know that water is made of molecules, specifically H2O. If you hold these two ideas in your head with the realization that water consists of countless individual molecules, you can now begin to appreciate the Higgs boson. The Higgs field that gives subatomic particles their mass is made of countless individual Higgs bosons, just like water is made of individual molecules. You should keep in mind that the Higgs boson hasn't been discovered yet. And what I'm describing is simply the most popular idea as to why subatomic particles have the masses that they do. As I speak, my colleagues and I are studying data taking huge particle accelerators to see if this idea is true. So that's a Higgs boson. It's something that gives mass to particles. Without it, we will all be massless and flying around the world at the speed of light, which means atoms, molecules, nothing can be formed. So that's why it is so important. Okay, next is um, scientists confirm God particle. As a layman, I would now say, I think we have it. Do you agree? Yeah. Yeah. Until today, the so-called God symbol, the key to our understanding of the universe, existed only in theory. This is CERN, anymore. Switzerland, where it was discovered. Data like this, scientists at CERN have announced the discovery with 99.999% certainty that the Higgs boson does exist, the so-called God particle. Professor Peter Higgs, now 83 years old, who first theorized its existence in 1964, was in the audience for this historic moment. For me, it's really an incredible thing that it happened in my lifetime. <laughs> so what is the God particle, and just what does it do? Well, in one sense, it is the missing link to this massive equation. This is the standard model for particle physics, and this is our understanding of how the universe works. The Higgs boson gives us mass, which is how we measure matter, the stuff we are made of. Scientists say without mass, stars, galaxies, and planets would not have been able to spin themselves into existence after the Big Bang. So how did scientists find it? Well, with a massive particle collider at CERN, 27 kilometers of tunnels under Switzerland and France. Researchers smashed particle beams together to see what's inside, effectively recreating the Big Bang trillions of times over and over. And this is what they saw. Subatomic debris, including the decayed remains of what they say appears to be the Higgs boson, thereby proving its existence. But the mysteries of the universe are not solved yet. Consider this. All those galaxies, planets, and stars, everything we can see, well, they make up only 4% of the universe. There's still a lot more to discover. Finding the Higgs boson, the God particle, just opens another door. Insignificant though this bottle of compressed hydrogen gas looks, it marks the beginning of the world's largest and most powerful particle accelerator chain, culminating in CERN's spectacular Large Hadron Collider. Hydrogen atoms from this gas cylinder are fed at a precisely controlled rate into the source chamber of a linear accelerator, CERN's LINAC-2, where their electrons are stripped off to leave hydrogen nuclei. These are protons and have a positive charge, enabling them to be accelerated by an electric field. Their journey to eventually take part in ultra-high energy collisions, similar to those following the Big Bang, can now begin. This initial acceleration has caused Linux 2 to be likened to the lumbering first stage of a huge rocket by the time this packet of protons leaves Linux 2, it'll be travelling at one-third the speed of light. It's about to enter the booster, stage two of the rocket, if you will. In order to maximise the intensity of the beam, the packet is divided up into four, one for each of the booster's rings. Straight acceleration is now impractical, and the booster is circular, 
157 meters in circumference. In order to accelerate the packets, they are repeatedly circulated, and the electric field is now pulsed in the same way that you push a child on a swing each time they reach a certain point. Magnets exert a force on the passing protons at right angles to their direction of motion, and so powerful electromagnets are used to bend the beam of protons round the circle. The booster accelerates the protons up to 91.6% of the speed of light and squeezes them closer together. Recombining the packet from the four rings, it's then flung on into the proton synchrotron, by analogy, stage three of our rocket. Let's just follow two such proton packets. The proton synchrotron is 628 meters in circumference, and they circulate for 1.2 seconds, reaching over 99.9% .9 of the velocity of light. It's here that the point of transition is reached, a point where the energy added to the protons by the pulsating electric field cannot translate into increased velocity as they're already approaching the limiting speed of light. Instead, the added energy manifests itself as increasing mass of the protons. In short, the protons can't go faster, so they get heavier. The microscopic kinetic energy of each proton is measured in units called electron volts, and now the energy of each proton has risen to 25 giga electron volts, or JEV. The protons are now 25 times heavier than they are at rest. The packets of protons are now channeled into stage 4, the superproton synchrotron, a huge ring 7 kilometers in circumference, designed specifically to accept protons at this energy and increase it to 450 JEV. Soon, the packets of protons will be energized sufficiently to be launched into the orbit of the gigantic Large Hadron Collider, or LHC, which lies between the Jura Mountains and the Alps, and straddles both France and Switzerland. Lying deep underground, it has a circumference of 27 kilometers. There are two vacuum pipes within the LHC, containing proton beams traveling in opposite directions. Using ultra-sophisticated kickers to synchronize incoming packets with those already circulating, one vacuum pipe has injected into it protons which will circulate clockwise, and the other protons which will circulate anti-clockwise. The counter-rotating beams cross over in the four detector caverns, where they can be made to collide. The energy of the collision is double that of the individual opposing protons, and it's the debris from these collisions that is tracked in the detectors. For half an hour, the SPS injects protons. Finally, there are 2,808 packets. During this time, the LHC adds extra energy to each proton, whose velocity is now so near the speed of light that it goes round the 27-kilometer ring over 11,000 times each second, getting a boost of energy at each revolution from the pulsed electric field. Finally, each proton has an energy of 7 tera electron volts, and they're 7,000 times heavier than at rest. The magnetic force needed to keep the beams bending to the ring is so enormous that nearly 12,000 amps must flow through its electromagnets. This is achieved by making the LHC colder than outer space, so that its magnets become superconducting. Now the protons are ready to collide in the detectors. A steering magnet finally brings them onto a collision course. The total energy of two protons colliding in the LHC is 14 tera electron volts and reproduces similar states to moments after the Big Bang. Particle tracks from these collisions will be analysed by computers connected to the detectors and it's hoped these tracks will give a new insight into the very birth of our universe. How our universe has evolved, what governs its behaviour today, and where it's going in the future. So there you are. 
And it's big science. It's called big science because it involves billions of dollars and thousands of people working on it. And each one of these detectors is like a multi-storied building. So, so much data is generated, they have to be analyzed, checked and rechecked by thousands of people working all over the world. And eventually everybody agrees, got it. Fascinating, isn't it? People will not rest. That's the beauty of science. Each time you find something new, it opens up new questions, new doorways to even stranger things which one couldn't even think of or imagine. What is the state? Of theoretical physics. Excellent. You know, I mean, People I don't know what you... They do not need all this. Huh? They do not need all, all this complex equipment. The theoretical physics. Oh, the theoretical physics. No, you just need a piece of paper and a pen <laughs> and your mind. Yeah. And, uh, that's how Higgs did it, that's how Bose yeah. did it, that's but how Einstein did it. But then the problem is that you need actual proof in the lab. Without that, it's just your idea. I have another idea. How do you test? So ultimately, physics has to depend on experiments, observations. Your ideas have to be checked against them. Are there people with ideas now? Yes, sure. All the string theorists have only ideas. Nothing else. <laughs> uh, they do physics in a strange way, which Einstein didn't do. Einstein started with phenomena which are known, and then constructed some theory, found something odd or so on. Nowadays, people just say, don't forget about what exists in the world. Let's think of the something fantastic. That's not the way physics has been done in the past, but in the last 40 years, a lot of people have done just that. So there is no connect. Without connections, without these connects, there is no physics. It then becomes just hypothesis after hypothesis after hypothesis. No, each one had a reason. Like Bose had a reason, Einstein had a reason. He saw something which could not be explained. It's not just daydreaming. Supposing I were in a world like this, no. Something has happened. Something is known, something is disturbing, something I cannot understand. Not I, just physics cannot understand. Then the inquiry begins. But then the idea that comes up is quite independent of that in a sense. It's not logically connected to that. It's a huge intuitive leap. It's constructive. But once you've constructed it, you have to come down to what can be tested. If you can't do that, then your theory will remain untested and just a curiosity. That's the way physics is done. Hmm? Any questions? Would you like to take part in an experiment like that? No? Yes.
So somehow or other, the world of the very small is getting connected with the very large world in a strange way because as they are saying, in each of these collisions, the temperature produced uh, or the conditions are something like if shortly after the Big Bang, you are simulating those things. So these are kind of mini Big Bangs happening, quite harmless. So people want to learn from there what happened in the early stages of the universe. So that's how they are getting connected. Sir, how can we find out the mystery of the universe uh, by studying those particles in the sun? Yes, you just now heard. But if you want to go and understand deeply exactly what you can learn, then you have to learn a lot of physics. There's no other way. They are hoping to find out, first of all, they wanted to search for all the particles that were predicted by the standard model. Again, the standard model was just written down by two or three people because they were interested in symmetries, beauty of the world, so they wrote down an equation. Steven Weinberg, Abdus Salam, mainly these two people. I had the great opportunity of knowing Professor Salam quite well. And then they said, this world should have these other particles, go and look for them. So CERN found out the, all the new things that were predicted by Salam and Weinberg, like the W boson, the Z boson. The only thing missing was the Higgs boson. They found that also. Now, they want to know whether there is something called supersymmetry. Supersymmetry means putting bosons and fermions together into something of higher symmetry, which will unify bosons and fermions. People have found if that happens, then there will be, for every fermion, there should be a super partner. For every boson, there should be a super partner. So there's a whole doubling of everything. Now, do such particles exist? Will these experiments, these banks, show some signs that they are being produced? That's another thing they are looking for. So far, the, so far, the results are negative. They want to know whether we live in a four-dimensional world or there is some higher dimension. Things like that. So it's not just imagining a higher dimension. They want to actually do an experiment to find out whether there is actually such a higher dimension. If so, what is its nature? Fascinating. But to really understand all these things, you have to study physics, mathematics. Otherwise, you, you get roughly an idea, but not really it. As all of you know, I mean, uh, if to, to understand Buddhism really well, you have to really study hard for years. Just reading a few books will not give you, it will give you a flavor of what it is about, but not exactly what it is. So it's science. And the language of science is mathematics, so you have to learn mathematics. But It is also true that everybody cannot learn mathematics, but should everybody be kept in the dark about what is happening in science? No. You've seen this, all these videos which are being made, all the lectures which are being given, they are aimed to give laymen some idea, some excitement about what is happening there. Somebody has said, or, or many great people have said, that if you cannot explain what you are doing to a layman, then you have not actually understood what you are doing. So, 
So you may have found out through these lectures that I do not understand what I'm talking about. Any questions? All stunned into silence. <laughs> yes. Huh? Yeah. No, no, no. Helium, uh, there are other things which become superfluids, like liquid nitrogen. Liquid nitrogen, yes. Uh, no. Liquid nitrogen itself is not a superfluid. No, yeah. You have to go down. Uh, to, yeah, you have to go down to those temperatures, four degrees. But you have helium four. These are all helium four. That is that isotope of helium which is called helium four. People have tried to also make helium three into a superfluid. But helium-3 actually is a fermion. So it's difficult. I mean, then you have to somehow make them into a boson first and then it becomes superfluid. Only bose will flow freely, not fermi. What do you mean changed? Uh, Ch what changed? Uh, was he invited to to some other institute or he continued to, uh, to stay in India? Oh, 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 I see. Yeah. No, it certainly changed his career because uh, he was having all kinds of difficulties in Dhaka University. They reduced his uh, pay package, not be him, but everybody's. So he was fighting that. He said, I came with this contract. You, how can you change it now? But at that time, Dhaka University had problems with getting money. And so, and then, uh, although his friend M.N. Saha had already become a great name, we'll see what he did. He was not yet that well known. I mean, everybody knew he was a kind of a genius, but he hadn't yet done anything. So when he did this and Einstein sent him a postcard in which he said, Dear colleague, what you have done is beautiful. He showed it to the university. They immediately gave him all the money. <laughs> and the, the, then he, he went with that letter to the German embassy. They immediately gave him a visa. Because here was Einstein saying that you have done something beautiful. So that changed his. So for two years he went off study leave. And he, uh, for the first year he was in Paris with um, Sil Silva Lavi and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he found him a place there. Because Silva Lavi's student, Bagchi, was there already. Uh, who was a friend of S. N. Bose. So she, he lived in a house in Paris where there were other Indians also. But they were all suspected to be anti-British. So the British got worried and they in fact wrote a letter to Silva Levy to find out what this guy was doing. And he, he said he's a fine man, there's no problem with him. So he went to Madame Curie, wanted to work in her lab to learn chemistry because he told me that when he came back he had to build all these departments in Dhaka. So he wanted to learn a lot of things. So he went to Madame Curie and Madame Curie gave him a big lecture that Indian students come here, they don't know French and they cannot follow everything. You go back and learn French and then come back. Now Bose could speak French fluently but he he was awed by Madame Curie and he didn't say, tell her that I, I can speak French. So he came away. Then he went to Maurice 
de Broglie. There's another prince, not the Louis, Prince Louis de Broglie, but his brother, elder brother. They were princes, so they had a stable. And uh, Maurice de Broglie was converting one of the stables into a X -ray, first X-ray crystallography lab in the world. So Bose worked with him for six months and learned X-ray crystallography. When he came back to Dhaka, he set up the first X-ray crystallography department in Dhaka. Then, the following year, 1925, he went to Berlin and he was with Einstein. But he also worked with other chemists there while he was there. But then he came back And uh, he kind of moved out of the mainstream of physics. But he was busy building Dhaka University, teaching people here, because people like him were more interested in uh, building up Indian society. He could have easily settled there, but no. And that is why we are where we are today. It's because of the sacrifices of such people. They didn't consider that to be sacrifice. We, we are saying sacrifices from our standpoint. They really loved their country. They, they wanted to come back. They wanted to teach people science because they knew that without science and technology, the country will not progress. So it's people like S. N. Bose, M. N. Saha, Sir J. C. Gore, they were all class friends. They built up the entire structure of science and technology in this country. Put it on the world map. Here were people, Pose, Saha, Raman, you know, they were big names in the West also. Before them was Sir J. C. Bose. So all this happened in Calcutta and of course a bit bit in Dhaka. So Sociologists should also find out why this happened here and not elsewhere, like your question.